Okay, and now if we sh share the screen, does it work now? Great success. <laughs> there you go. Okay. Okay. Well, just a second. Yes. Okay. PowerPoint. Okay. Here we go. Okay. So uh, better get going before it's too late. So it, very happy to be here uh, via, via YouTube. Uh, I will uh, talk uh, a little bit about our work uh, from our studio. I thought I'd show first, I'll show some architectural work. I'll finish with the project that Santiago referred to, the meteorite. I'll show a couple of other architectural projects that, you know, as a build up to that uh, project. But in order to kick this off, I'll, I'll show a project which is about a restaurant, uh, which I think um, interestingly raises some issues that we we are concerned with uh, in the uh, building projects as well. Uh, so I'll start with the restaurant and I'll show a couple of small architectural projects more briefly, and then I'll show uh, the meteorite uh, as, as a, a grand finale. So uh, just a few words about our studio. Uh, we're based in Helsinki, but as everybody else, I suppose after COVID, we're now split between Italy and Helsinki, uh, where funnily enough, uh, these days a Finnish Italian studio. We have a fantastic team of people uh, from Italy working with us. My sister is placed in, located in Italy at the moment. And then we have a team here in Helsinki and we're making the best of the design cultures of both of these countries in our work. Uh, for some reason, I have always uh, wanted to avoid uh, sticking my, like putting myself into a box of either a designer or an architect, somebody who does residential buildings, somebody who does artworks, et cetera, et cetera. And, and uh, in order to avoid this, I've uh, explained, I, I started to talk about, you know, designing human experiences because essentially that's what is at the, at the uh, heart of our work. Turn that other screen away. Uh, so in order to uh, illustrate what that means in, in practice, let me show you this first project. Uh, this was a uh, project restaurant called Ultima, and uh, it was designed for a couple of Finland's best chefs. They wanted to create a circular economy uh, restaurant. And our job was to take this historical building and uh, somehow try to create an experience which would be, you know, of course, commercially successful so that the restaurant doesn't go bankrupt, uh, but would also at the same time try to challenge people's conventions, try to um, help people rethink or encourage people rethink their relationship to food, how it's produced, how it's consumed, etc. And, and uh, this is an interesting conundrum because on the, on the one hand, a restaurant is there to ent entertain, take you away from the everyday reality. You don't want to go there to be lectured. You don't want to go to a restaurant to be really taught anything. You, uh, <clears throat> and you certainly don't want to deal with the challenges of today. You go there to enjoy a nice evening with friends or your loved ones. And, uh, so the, the, the challenge was to somehow within this uh, inherently commercial context, create an environment that would seduce you uh, into challenging uh, some of your conventions about food. So what we did is we created uh, a sequence of spaces, each of which was contained a different story, if you will, and that would take you deeper and deeper uh, into this experience. And a key uh, device in this, uh, 
you know, act of seduction, if you will, uh, where these objects, uh, and for lack of a better term, we call them, they're like art objects. So they're, they're these objects that are placed around the, uh, the, the restaurant that serve a quotidian and everyday, everyday function. Uh, but when you examine them more closely, you suddenly realize that something very strange is going on. So, for example, here you, you enter the restaurant and you're surrounded by this uh, room in which there's, at the time, the world's largest vertical hydroponic uh, 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 sort of greenhouse. And so it's a cir closed circuit water system in within which all the, uh, the, the veggies, the spices, etc., were grown. And the chefs in this open kitchen would harvest these vegetables and prepare food from them. But then these spheres on top of the, the in, on top of the space levitating here, they are lamps, but they're kind of quite weird. If you look at them more closely, they have all these appendices and little you know, technical gadgets. And when really started to pay attention, you realize that they're filled with crickets. And of course, this is almost like a scene from the horror film suddenly suddenly the a lamp we all know that a lamp lamps often have insects you don't really want them here there but here they were on purpose and this would then either freak someone out uh, would you know make someone else very curious uh, but regardless of the person there would be always be a conversation and the conversation would be you know, in this open space and the chefs and the waiters would participate in this conversation. And it would give them an opportunity to talk about, you know, the issues that have to be, uh, have to do with uh, responsible sources for protein, circular economy, the fact that that salad from the wall is actually, you know, prepared for you on the plate, but the leftovers go for these insects and that biscuit that you're about to eat actually has cricket protein uh, in it. So this was a simple example of how, you know, without lecturing, without uh, uh, explaining, we try to use experiences in order to seduce, you know, with a sense of humor, with, with some sense of horror, try to seduce people into having these conversations and, and uh, seduce them into a place where they suddenly start questioning their uh, preconceptions and their conventions. And you can see this same, these same surrealist techniques or design techniques deployed throughout all scales of designs. Of course, not everywhere, but at strategic moments. So here in that restaurant, there was another instance of architectural columns that actually seem to carry the weight of the space, but when you look inside, they, act, they have hydroponic potatoes. And this is a Finnish company that grows potatoes in the air, then they, the yield is ne nearly tenfold. Uh, they take much less water. And of course, here in the restaurant, they were there, you know, also as a conversation piece, something that would again, uh, you know, be fun, something fun to discuss, but also in that discussion, it, that discussion would take you into places uh, that are current and, and uh, that that are critical uh, for our time. Here, you know, uh, when you would go a little bit deeper in the restaurant, you would encounter these black spheres with white oyster mushrooms protruding through them. These spheres were filled with coffee grains, used coffee grains from Helsinki cafes. And then spores were placed into little holes in these glass spheres, and they turned into these magnificent Baroque sculptures. And then the chefs would slice off some of the mushrooms and prepare you your food. So again, uh, you know, it's it's at once just a beautiful object, but then there are layers and layers and layers of of narrative. Uh, which are not pushed, but that you discover uh, and you interpret differently depending on who you are. And it's this kind of uh, game of, of combining 
experiential design with criticality and, and aim towards cultural change, which characterizes everything that we're trying to uh, do in our work. So, of course, the other extreme could be to just, you know, when you design human experiences, you could well be a casino designer whose only aim is to make people, you know, help people rid themselves of their money and lose any sense of time. So you can use experiences in design towards different aims. And then in this case, we like to think of ourselves and we believe we are the culturally critical uh, actors. And we try to work with you know, clients that share our values and share our aims. So here, as you go deep to the restaurant, you'll encounter these imaginary hybrids of plants and fungi and insects that were designed there as artwork, again, in order to help close conversation about, you know, DNA manipulation on, on existing categories and conventions. This is a flower beetle. They're all little 3D printed things. And all of this would take place in this, you know, old historical uh, building. And as you would go into the last space of the building, we, you know, hope that all of these little triggers would have, you know, like introduced almost like a dreamlike state. And by the time you go into this vaulted historical space, you suddenly realize that the architecture itself is trying to behave in an unexpected manner. And what we're trying to do is to, you know, set the mood in which you receive this unusual food from the chefs. And, and we're trying to put you in the mood where you're ready to experiment and you're ready to uh, question um, uh, your preconceptions and you're open to, you know, trying something new. So here you basically see some windows that were covered with these large CNC milled sculptural forms that almost like it's like playing jazz on top of the old space where these forms try to, you know, riff off and, and uh, engage the, 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 you know, historical architecture. And then in the middle of the space, you see this thing which everybody first looks at and then it looks like it's something that, that's familiar from a natural history museum a skeleton in the space but when you look at it more closely you realize it's actually a bunny that's jumping through space and now we're fully in a in a dream mode where we're not you know in everyday reality anymore and by now you should realize that you know there's a bit of humor in all of this all of those chairs all the tables everything's designed by us and, and even the chairs are designed so that you know, it's not this monotonous repetition of, of objects that you associate with military and order, but rather a kind of humane variation and then <clears throat> of, of uh, asymmetrical shapes. So there's the little tail of the bunny. And, and this, you know, game is taken from one scale, the scale of the architecture to the scale of the napkin holders, to the scale of little objects to hold food. Uh, your, uh, Amuse bush served on a 3D print and, and so on. So I wanted to show this project before showing some of the architectural, the most recent architectural work is because it's so, uh, so beautifully uh, makes the, the challenge clear uh, because it, 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 it is a commercial enterprise that's there to entertain people and people have to be willing to go there and pay for this experience. And so how do you, how are you, how do you combine that with being culturally critical and then suggesting that people would challenge uh, some of the conventions that they've grown accustomed to. So this is, this is what we try to do with our work. And so when we're working with Santiago mentioned form as a topic, and it's the name of the lecture series, uh, uh, um, when we use form, it's, it's always with intent. And, and uh, of course, underlying this, there could be many other lectures that just has to do with, for example, the set of digital techniques in design and manufacturing that makes this kind of you know, customized restaurant experience, for example, possible. But uh, that's not really the, the topic of, of, of the talk today. But uh, when you look at the forms that we use, I, you, you should 
I hope that you will see how they're used strategically always uh, towards a certain effect. So I'll show now a couple of architectural projects, just briefly, not holistically. One was completed recently. One is still in completion. I don't even have really uh, good photography of, of it yet. But they both introduced issues that are uh, pertain to this uh, kind of focus of the rest uh, lecture, which is uh, the meteorite building. So the UFO is uh, is a tiny building. It's a building as an object. It's entirely made of cross laminated timber. Uh, it's entirely digitally prefabricated, and because of its size, it's also prefabricated within uh, within a, a uh, within a hall inside, and it's designed in order to fit on a bed of a truck, uh, and it's shipped on site on on steel pallet and just dropped there, and then it's everything is included. Uh, everything is all the appliances, everything's ready to go in this little building. And uh, you know, typical for all of these projects that we're doing is that obviously these days these are digitally designed but not only that they're all prefabricated and then the question whether things are assembled on site or in, a, in somewhere else or they're assembled in bigger pieces before they're brought on site it simply has to do with the log logistics of shipping and cranes and, and, and so on but uh, I think it's worth emphasizing that that uh, you know as somebody Santiago mentioned uh, uh, I started in working creatively misusing the computer in the 90s and I was part of that first generation of of, uh, of people uh, like FOA uh, that uh, were excited about the possibilities that the digital held and for a very long time uh, those possibilities had to be mostly to do with design and, and less with materials and manufacturing. Uh, or, or at least the manufacturing technologies were quite expensive. Uh, but now, for example, in, with cross-laminated timber, it's essentially you know solid timber elements where you know uh, you of, of about three centimeter in thickness that you laminate in different directions in order to get this isometric sheet, uh, which comes at you know usually it's twelve or sixty meters long and about three and a half wide. And, and what's beautiful about this material, of course, is that is that uh, it, it's cut robotically, and so everybody who's you know in the field, um, I'm sure you understand know what you know what's possible when a robot is is the manufacturing technology. It, it really doesn't care whether it cuts rectangles or triangles or more complex shapes or ang uh, <coughs> angles. Uh, a little bit depending on the production line and and what that of course makes possible is that you can suddenly make uh, quite unique architecturally unique uh, even customizable uh, buildings out of solid timber and then there's there's this uh, beautiful moment of coalescence of of, of uh, timber as an age-old construction material especially in, in, in the nordic countries uh, but elsewhere as well and and uh, and contemporary digital design and manufacturing technology, and this is suddenly making possible, you know, buildings that are have great air quality, that have great lifespan, uh, that have all of the traditional benefits of a log cabin, uh, but they're suddenly they can be formally exciting, and they're open for explore, uh, experimentation and exploration, and and. Uh, that's why uh, I think for the last you know five years we've more or less exclusively now work with wood uh, digitally fabricated wood elements uh, on our buildings. So this little building it's it's designed intentionally to look like an object so that on the exterior it is as small and as compact as possible. It's designed so that the roof and the bottom they, they mirror each other so you could it looks like you could flip it upside down. Uh, uh, it's it's uh, trying to, you know, be kind of you know have have a kind of object oriented 
strength to it uh, in the sense that it's not uh, taking really cues from the context, but rather it's this effect producing little object that once you enter it, it will frame the surrounding nature in a dramatic way. And one of the most dramatic things that it has is that there's a really big skylight in proportion to the building size in the middle. And you know, one of the nicest things about working with cross laminated timber is actually glass because the unlike most timber construction it doesn't really move that much which means that you can use very large insulated glass elements uh, without frames which makes it much less expensive and it makes it much more elegant to join these two materials so suddenly you have this this possibility of making this almost this yin yang uh, constellations with large sheets of glass and large sheets of wood interlocking in order to produce spaces. And uh, this particular project, uh, you can go check it uh, afterwards. We also wanted to not just experiment with, uh, you know, rethinking how you might build out of wood and, and rethinking how people might want to live in this case this is a tiny you know 30 square meter building uh, um, that tries to sort of harness everything that's wonderful in the nature around it uh, it's trying to it, it has no other insulation except wood as wood fiber in the ceiling but we also wanted to see whether you could uh, because the files are digital whether you could sell this building in a new way. And we launched uh, world's first uh, uh, architectural NFT together with, uh, with our friends, Jonathan Hall and uh, Ula Maria Koivola, who are the clients for, uh, for the meteorite. And, and Jonathan has worked for a long time for Meta. And, and he helped us with people from OpenSea actually devise the first architectural NFT. And that simply means that when you would buy the NFT for the UFO, for example, you don't just get the image of the building, but you get the actual manufacturing files. So you could, for example, in Buenos Aires, buy it and quote unquote print the pieces. And then all you need is somebody to assemble it for you. And, and given the size of this, this is probably not even an issue in terms of permits. But we're trying to like uh, we're thinking of these kind of wooden architectural projects that that I, I'm, I'm showing. We're thinking of these as sort of architectural projects for the green transition. And and I always get a little bit nauseated when I hear sus about sustainability and green transition transition because it uh, would it, it's usually a little bit tiresome and means that there are no new architectural ideas there. There's just you know, the use of a new material category. But uh, what uh, we're really trying to do is to think, rethink the entire value chain uh, that goes into uh, architecture made from wood, including how you might sell the drawings, how contracts might be formed and so on. So this next uh, project, before I go to the main project of the evening is called Uspa. It means fog. It's because in front of this building, there's always fog. This is just a computer image. I don't have a finished image, but this is an interesting project because it's, I wanted to show you uh, concretely what it means to sort of combine the new and the old. So on one hand, uh, you know, wooden construction techniques in, in Europe and in Japan <coughs> were perfected already centuries ago. And, and uh, so on one hand, you have this age old knowledge of, of how to create form, like form locking wood joints, for example, in, in, in uh, the countries around the Alps or, or in Japanese wood architecture. And, and uh, that kind of uh, joinery <coughs> and approach is of course beautifully suited with digitally fabricated components because the, the CNC mills and, and uh, different robotic cutting instruments uh, have the flexibility uh, to produce these, these kinds of joints with relative ease. 
what it requires is that you know how to do this. And we had the fortune of working with a, with a young French master builder who was trained in traditional building techniques and in digital manufacturing. And this USWA project is now an example of a project where you combined massive cross-laminated timber elements, excuse me, with uh, post and beam structures that are uh, form locking. So there really are no visible nails, there are no visible, there are no metal sheets. Uh, all you see are wooden uh, joinery. And here you see the exterior walls of this building being assembled and it took exactly two days to assemble all of the walls in a 400 square meter residential building and here you see some of the post and beam elements at a, at a factory uh, in in central finland and when you put the two, two two together what you get is this you can see some snow on the structures uh, this is from last winter but you can start imagining what's what's possible, right? That suddenly, you know, this building is, you know, in an interesting place between a contemporary building and a, a vernacular building. Uh, every single thing is designed and digitally manufactured, but a lot of the knowledge that has gone into the joinery and, <clears throat> and the construction is centuries old. And I think uh, when if if you're interested in building out of wood i think uh this is probably the way to go i think it's it's worthwhile exploring more and more you know forgotten knowledge uh techniques that uh were forgotten or or were no longer relevant during uh, let's say more, the more industrial era when uh, parts would have to be as manufactured in large series and they would be, have to be as simple as possible here like each joint potentially uh, could be different uh, <clears throat> if you have the ability to design them. So this I just got from Facebook yesterday of, of uh, Jonathan, our client, and, and his friend, the musician, testing the acoustics of this, this type of building, which, which are, of course, quite fantastic. So all of this leads to uh, the core of the lecture, which is this uh, project uh, the meteorite. And I like to think that this is a kind of small project that punches, I mean, at least it tries to punch a lot uh, beyond its size. Uh, we really set out to, you know, test many of these things that I just introduced. We wanted to see how you could use sensation and experience in, your ch in order to challenge people's conventions about what residential living might be. We wanted to show what was possible, you know, with wood and then digital design and fabrication techniques. And we wanted to, you know, challenge conventions such as, you know, phenomenal transparency, which means that a building should reveal on the outside or be honest on the outside what it contains on the inside. In this project, it's 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 rather a mystical object in the forest. And it does not at all reveal what's on the inside until you go there and you play with the inside and you discover uh, <clears throat> what it, the affordances and, and uh, the experiences uh, hidden in there. So this is in in pretty extreme climate in the near the Arctic uh, area in, in sort of central eastern Finland uh, near the Russian border, and. It's designed much like the little UFO. It's designed to be very object-like. This is an era area where there are lots of ice ice age boulders and formations. So it isn't culturally as strange as one might think. Uh, it's not so unusual to see these kinds of odd, massive, uh, imposing uh, figures in the, in the forest. Uh, it's you know, we try to use everything we learned about form in designing it. So every side of the building is different and it's quite carefully, for example, apertures are used so that it doesn't reveal uh, its scale or size easily, unless you have a human figure there. 
And when you're on the outside, it operates at the scale of the environment, at the scale of the forest. And as I said, you don't really uh, know what's on the inside. But on the inside, you actually, what you get is an intricate constellation of, of boxes that are interlocked and, and open all the way to the sky. And the top of the, the atrium, if you will, there's a large uh, 10 square meter skylight. Uh, creating this kind of James Terrell uh, moment, if you will. Here at the seven and a half meters, the entire floor is covered with a net, which allows you to actually suspend yourself in this in the middle of this uh, space. And as you can see, you know, there are no other materials beyond two layers of, of cross laminated timber. This drawing is from, uh, from a beautiful book, uh, the, of the cover of which I will show you uh, shortly. And it was not drawn by us, it was drawn by Princeton students on, on top of uh, our design. Uh, and uh, with wonderful detail, it even includes my German short hair pointer and, and Jonathan, the client's his guitar here. But you get a sense of the, 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 the key idea here, which I have called the misfit. And the idea is that you, rather than have a, you know, an external wall and ex internal wall follow one another, you just let them not fit together. And you, you create a constellation of spaces on the interior, which responds to the human body, to the scale of the object, to the scale of the guitar or the dog. And on the outside, you create another form, which response to the scale of the environment and the misfit between the two in this case creates this large Porsche and that Porsche is used for appliances, technical systems, storage and then these indentations that you see in these larger spaces and then it's used for insulation and actually air circulates within this Porsche and keeps it dry if the outside envelope leaks from these seams which has happened then the circulating air will eventually dry it and there's nothing but wood so uh, it's it's kind of like an old boat in that sense and here you have another se uh, sequence of drawings from uh, from the book the cover of which is here i highly recommend you get this book it's really wonderful uh, there's many beautiful architectural projects that all use different um, natural materials from bamboo to, to uh, hemp to cross laminated timber. But the, here you see the idea and, and <clears throat> organizationally speaking, and I think I have always, it's, it's not like, uh, I don't know if anybody else has called it misfit, but uh, the first time I encountered this idea was the losing uh, proposal by Jean Nouvel and Philip Stark for the Tokyo Opera House, which was a black monolith with the concert halls staged as golden objects. And the space between the two, the misfit space, was the public space that you would supposedly occupy. But this kind of the experience of this kind of diagram, where uh, the inside and the outside don't match but produce a poche is you know, rife with opportunity. And uh, there are all sorts of technical possibilities. Uh, but most interestingly, I think it affords you, uh, most interestingly, the uh, possibilities have to do with uh, experience. So it really allows you to uh, design one experience on the outside and have that experience stage your experience on the on the inside and in this case you can see how the two the inside constellation of intricate boxy forms uh, are wrapped inside the polygonal shell and then they're connected by what we call these window tunnels and these tunnels are so deep that you can even sleep in in some of these tunnels so here, to finish off, I'll sh uh, show a sequence of photography to get you a sense of what it might be to visit. It's, it's very difficult to communicate because the, 
especially the space on the interior is, is very three-dimensional, so it's very hard to capture as in a 2D photograph, but I hope you get some uh, sense of it. And I hope, you know, what is communicated is, is also this, uh, what we're really trying to figure out is, is how to create, much like in the restaurant, how to create uh, uh, a new lifestyle and a new aesthetic for wood construction, especially in Scandinavia, it comes with a lot of, of convention and, and uh, tradition, and it's not perhaps, you know, the most, or hasn't been considered the most exciting architectural material in terms of possibilities of, of expression. And what we're trying to do here is, is of course, you know, again, you know, provoke you first by creating these strange striking objects but then make it inviting enough so that you would consider it, you would explore it, and maybe as you have experienced it, you would come out transformed and you might think of yourself or feel differently in the world. And frankly, you know, that's pretty much everything that architecture as an art form can do. It can't really force you to do anything. Uh, I don't think it's, you know, it's wonderful to do things out of wood, but that's not, that, that, that says nothing about the architectural or the uh, artistic merits of the building. I think those are evaluated in terms of uh, the experiences that the building uh, engenders and, and the kind of whether the building has uh, what one critic called cultural escape velocity, whether it captures people's imaginations. And, and whether you know it becomes part of conversations, and whether it causes people to uh, think of themselves and think of the spaces they occupy in a different way. So here, you know, from the outside, you enter into the building. There's a little kitchen uh, that you pass through. There are a bunch, uh, set of steps that take you up to a kind of mezzanine level. Uh, everything, you know. Every piece of furniture, everything's made from the same material and intentionally left without any very specific instructions for use, actually, which is, I remember Bashir and Alejandro said that the Oklahoma Port Terminal is a landscape with, one, with no instructions for use. I think this idea is still relevant. And I think in the case of the meteorite, it's been really beautiful to see how the family has, this was built finished during the COVID, and instead of a guest house, it became an office, it became a school, it became a home, and it could easily adapt to all of these challenges, not because there were movable walls, but because it was open for interpretation, and, and because it was filled with potential for use, or to put it differently, there were, it was filled with spaces without any determined use. Somebody might say useless spaces, but there's those spaces that then the children, the family, the guests would, would discover. So these kinds of uh, affordances uh, became key to the flexibility and the success of the building. And here in this strange view, the photographer is lying on the kitchen floor looking up through the skylight and you can see uh, our client and, and her son levitating there in, in the seven and a half meters up in this space. So <clears throat> I think ultimately what you, when you work with, when we work with form, what we think about are, especially in this case, is the atmosphere that's created and how that atmosphere impacts social space. And by social space, uh, I know, whether everybody knows what I mean by the term, but I simply mean uh, how it impacts life, how you know a certain atmosphere will, in a very subtle manner, make you feel in a particular way, set the stage uh, for you know social interaction. And of course, in a home, this is you know more important than anywhere. And in this case, this is a home in which all the spaces are three-dimensionally interlocked around this void. And of course, that literally means that you can talk from the kitchen up to the net 
from the net up to this platform here and to a third kit, which is, you know, in the window higher up there. And it literally means like a little bit like in Hitchcock's rear window that across this atrium, you can, you can have your little nook or, uh, and, and be there privately while observing uh, your family around. And then you can move a little bit and you can engage, uh, you know, more socially, if you will. And what, of course, this should do is to create, you know, a stage for better life, a, a stage for a different kind of more interconnected, more enjoyable, you know, family life, a, a different way of being together. And, and so architecture in one way, is, like, I like to think of, you know, function as a possibility. I like to think that function, it certainly is a possibility of form as much as form is a result of function. There are, when you design a form, there are always certain constraints that over-determine you can, what you can work with that, uh, with. But then beyond that, the more you can build in potential that, uh, for interpretation, the more you can leave things open-ended, uh, the better. So you can work on the level of organization in a very specific manner, the way we did, but you can let the program be nearly completely open-ended, which was the case for the meteorite. And the program we left as much as possible for the for the clients to invent. You know, the bathroom has a shower and a toilet bowl, and the kitchen has appliances. But beyond that, how you use these spaces was up to them. And here to finish, you see some drone photography, and there's a little video here of, I think from last summer, of a friend here with a videographer and and the family that built the meteorite and you'll you'll also get a sense of the, the kind of setting which must be quite different from buenos aires but uh, it's just forest as far as the eye can see Okay, I think that was, uh, that's enough. That's already more than longer than I was advised to speak. But I think now might be a good time for, uh, for questions. I can let this run a little bit. But if there's somebody who has questions on, on the YouTube chat, uh, please go ahead. Mm. 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 No, I, uh, I think it's, I think your point is interesting uh, and it's a good question. I don't know if I have a ready made answer. I think in many cases you're correct. I think it's difficult to marry, you know, criticality, architecturally speaking, with uh, being responsible. I think in, in, in our case, what we, 
wanted to say um, was that you want to marry experiential design, which could easily, very easily be associated with designing, let's say, casinos or entertainment or uh, highly commercial projects. We're trying to you know, use some of those techniques uh, in projects that are critical of existing cultural conditions and therefore you know, right. we try we try to act responsibly so it's a slightly yeah. different interpretation of than, than you took you, you mean that you're talking about doing a like critical critical architectural project and, and in so right. doing you might do something irresponsible yeah yeah but i believe I believe that you are very responsible, critically speaking, in terms of uh, the architectural ideas that you are working with. Uh, I believe that in these projects uh, there is, uh, and maybe this can relate to another comment that I have, I don't know if it is a question, but it's a comment, regarding uh, the idea of these projects, especially this last one, but the, the other two uh, they are also doing something like this that is uh, and you said something like that in the end of the presentation regarding uh, a project that uh, involves ideas of architecture is it like universal ideas for architecture like this uh, I don't know I, I feel like there is some kind of neo-modernism ideas uh, in these strange objects uh, pose in the landscape, um, like an anti-urban idea for architecture, like they're like these uh, uh, villas, right, in the uh, in, in the uh, in the north of Italy, you know, like Palladian villas, like mm -hmm. posed there, and they are speaking about uh, like the essential problems of architecture. If there is an essential problem for mm -hmm. architecture. Um, is there something like that? Is there uh, an impulse to try to develop these weird objects uh, that are talking really about uh, what architecture, uh, why architecture is, is is in the world, in a sense? You know? uh, also, because you are you are like detaching these objects from problems of sustainability. sustainability uh, or problems about uh, the cities uh, or ideas about new materials uh, like in that sense they're quite uh, pure you know the, the ideas in these objects in these in these buildings are are quite uh, basic in a, in a good sense mm -hmm. um. Yes, I mean, of course, like, uh, yes, I mean, it's, it's uh, just purely architecturally speaking, uh, and it's, of course, the, what the buildings are trying to do is to challenge, on, on one hand, they draw on a number of other they stand in the shoulders of a number of other projects and, and architects, but they're also, of course, trying to <coughs> challenge and existing con uh, conventions, and, and, and they're hoping to create a new architectural aesthetic uh, and, and uh, you know, it sounds a little bit all, but of course, we're trying to create a new kind of architectural object as well that would, uh, in which you know, form, organization, the relationship of the form to its context, uh, all of these things would be to a degree uh, reimagined and, and uh, uh, rethought. And and in the, in the, it's interesting when you work in a kind of real projects like this that, that you the range in which within which you have to uh, 
the, the range within which you have the freedom to move intellectually. Because on, on one hand, you have, you have to address the issues that are very local, that have to do with local culture. And, and there are issues that are very practical. And then on the very, on the, on the other hand, on the very other end, there are issues that are, you know, sort of meta-architectural that has to have to do with architecture as a form of art and how this, this particular design is situated within that discourse and, and you know, which project is it related to and what is it that it contributes that's new, if anything. And I suppose that's, of course, that's one of the most uh, interesting conversations. Uh, I haven't thought of the Italian Palladian Villas, but that's that's interesting. <laughs> and it's, uh, it's interesting to see how different audiences in different places, like Buenos Aires is quite far away from here, uh, perceive the significance of the projects and the, and the and correlations that it creates, you know, in, in the history of architecture, but also in contemporary culture. Uh, yes, also you mentioned like this uh, undetermined use for the spaces uh, yeah. that the villas also have, like in, in the villas yeah. there are rooms, but they're not specified what are they yeah. for. Um, yes. And the centrality, like uh, the big uh, central space, all these things. Uh, I don't know. They, they talk about. Oh, that's a very cool. I like that. Yeah. That's a nice staging of the. I mean, it, nice, nice staging of the project in terms of artificial history and its its uh, those correlations. I'm going to use that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, very cool. well, in the, in in that sense and. Um, uh, there are some questions in the chat, but I'm going with one last question. Um, there, uh, as you were presenting the the projects, I was thinking about this uh, problem that is a a very contemporary problem of form regarding uh, practices that go through, uh, you may say, this process of digitalization or. Uh, problematization of the digital, or however do you wanna do you wanna call it? Uh, that is like this uh, idea of triangulation or uh, facetation of the of the volume. Mm. Uh, and I was thinking that you cannot do these projects without that component. It would it would not be a meteorite if it's not facetted, right? Mm -hmm. And and those places won't appear. Um, is there and also you you can find those ideas in 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 the project that you presented first, but in this one, it's like very uh, I don't know uh, upfront, you know, like the sure. idea of, of this facilitation is very important for this project. Um, yes, is there a, a a way to deal with this the the idea of continue continuity or um, continuous variation or the idea of the spline or spline-like uh, geometries that were so popular uh, like three decades ago. Um, there is some kind of like uh, reimagining those geometries into this uh, triangulation or faceted mm -hmm. geometries in your work, you may say that. Mm -hmm. Sure, like I almost want to feel like I should like, pull up <laughs> some of the some of the very early works that uh, we did. I think my, my um, I almost have to do it because it's worth sharing the screen so everybody's visual here. Let's see if you can. Answer your question visually speaking. Uh, this, you see my screen? Yes. This is the first competition I did in my life. This is 1997. It's the Finnish Embassy in Canberra. So it, it imagined a building as not an object, but as an entirely faceted intensification of the landscape. And 
you know, before that, 1995, I, you can hardly see this, but it designed, couldn't, nobody commissioned a building, so designed a piece of furniture, which was, was, was uh, designed as a landscape with, for no, with no instructions for use. And it was a hybrid uh, between folded geometries and, and curved, basically nerves, curved space geometries. And at that yeah. time you couldn't really hybridize the two in a software. There were no, there was no subdivision surface modeling that would allow you to do this. So we produced a, you know, essentially a smooth surface and then introduced all of this foaming by hand. And, you know, ever since then, you know, to answer your question about, you know, this is 1999, the New York Times Millennium Capsule Competition finalist, which we did, which was essentially, a, without going to the project, a, a study of this type of formal language, which would be a hybrid between uh, you know, what we call creases and, and, and curves. And uh, so I, I have been, you know, sort of, let's say, been practicing, uh, where did I lose my presentation? I've been practicing the use of these formal devices for a while. And, and uh, I feel that I can, sort of, depending on the, the way that the thinking uh, works in terms of our projects, is that there's a conversation about the aims and the intents of the project. And then there's a, based on that, you select the formal techniques. And I, I think uh, you can move between these two worlds. But I think it's very hard to create, to be, not to have a little bit of like shop talk. I think it's very hard to do a, a kind of blob that would have this kind of, uh, you know, like this, this, the meteorite stands, you know, at least in this direction, like a ballerina and it has rhythm and it has pose. And it, it, uh, it has, you know, sculpturally speaking, tension. It's quite hard to do that without any folds or creases if you just do a smooth form. Right. And we're actually doing one building is entirely smooth, but, but uh, these formal techniques create quite different results, but sometimes you can hybridize the two uh, also. I don't know if I, that I get drift off your question. Or... No, that's that's so cool, yeah. Um, that so cool that you show that, that the first project that you <laughs> entered to the competition, because in a sense, these problems are were always there. No. Uh, yes. It's nice that you are now uh, building these uh, these projects uh, based on some kind of evolution or or like a, like a path uh, behind them in order to understand them. I think it's it's pretty cool. Well, I think there's like there's a big uh, there's one big difference that I, I think which is very one issue which is very different from the nineties. Uh, to this project, although there might be you know, literal surface geometry similarities, then uh, it's the idea of contrast and the idea of, of the object. I think all of those projects and uh, all the discussion, like the Yokohama in the 90s, had to do with continuity and, and variations within continuities, like the, the work of, of uh, all, all, most of the practices from that time dreamt of this kind of, you know strength of dealing with difference by through gradients and, and uh, yeah. therefore the use of topological surfaces and, and things that flowed from one state to the other. And, you know, funnily enough, uh, working, for example, I worked with other restaurant project, one Michelin star restaurant here where you go through 10 dishes during the evening. And the key to that restaurant is the contrast between the dishes. And and, and when you think of experiences, uh, you know, to, to have this kind of subtle gradient, it, it really doesn't create, it doesn't do much in your experience, but you think of um, more strategic, strategic staging of differences, uh, then you have a much richer palette. So I tend to think these days much more dermatologically, uh, I think of architecture as, as, as an act of staging differences. And when I think of 
the inside and the outside, I think about you know how this how the form is used in order to stage one difference after the other, and, and then how those relationships are you know tuned. And 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 once you go through this sequence, like how do you, how do you feel? And I think that that's very very different from the desire. The, these when Peter Eisenman did the church in Rome, it was also a project was all about you know, the building as an extension of a landscape, and that's where the folding came from into that project. This is doing something that's quite different, uh, even if it's using folding. Well, we have a, a conversation regarding this this idea uh, with uh, Young Anayata. I don't know if you know them, uh, mm -hmm. Michael Young and Kutan. Uh, yes. Well, this idea of uh, this transition from landscape to object, like um, mm -hmm. there's a uh, even the fresh Farshid practice uh, is, is quite uh, focusing on these mass objects, uh, th this idea of the inside and the outside uh, more radically uh, projected uh, instead of, mm -hmm. uh, well, you mentioned the, the Yokohama terminal that where inside and outside it's hard to, to, to see. You know? It's like, it's not that much of an object, but a, but a landscape, and I believe that these kind of projects are turning into again these original problems of architecture about the inside, the outside, and how this object is like a like a statement for these ideas of of uh, mm -hmm. of architecture. I find that very very elegantly put in your your work. So that's that's Thank very you. nice. Um, well, we have uh, some questions here. Uh, I can read them to you if you, sure. if you like. Um, we have one question from uh, Maximiliano that says, uh, having developed projects at various scales, from chairs to public buildings, which issues are you specific in each of these scales and which are broader, transversal to all of them? If there is a like a, 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 a an issue that that goes through all of yeah, this, yeah. yeah. Well, I, I think it's the issue. Of, for me, it's the issue of, of uh, experience. That's why I haven't invented a better slogan than designing human experiences, because I, I can think of knives and forks and tissues and glasses and chairs and interiors and buildings and even cities from that vantage point. And then the question would of course be like the okay, experiences towards what end? And that's where the you know criticality, I mean like generally being culturally critical and trying to intervene towards some you know betterment of the world and then response like acting responsibly. That's where these that comes in. But then I think the other part of the question is really interesting. Is what was the difference? And I think uh, there are like, huge differences between uh, different scales and how, how things work. So for example, a chair, it works almost always in repetition and it becomes something which like people populates the building. So if you think of the chair from the point of view of an experience, the chairs in this space, I would always think of those chairs not as industrial objects, but as, you know, um, I think of objects in general, you know, in spaces like as, as ecologies. So if you look at a building interior, it, it's filled with ecologies of objects, whether are there lights, tables, like different kinds of furnishings, etc. And I would pay attention to, for example, in the case of chairs, like w what what kind of experience they create. And that would mean uh, that, for example, if, if you have very, you know, you have a chair, all of which are in the same color, and then they're regularly organized, the associations of that are probably to like military formations or something that's not particularly, you know, soft and humane. So you might want, for some reason, you might want that kind of regimentation there, but I would be very sensitive to that. So I would think of them as an architectural device at that scale. 
And then, of course, if there are things that are even smaller, they often become something that you touch. Uh, glasses, objects, door handles, etc. There's a different kind of sensibility uh, that has to do with your hand. The chair, of course, eventually will engage with your body. Uh, you know, furniture, as far as you can, like you saw in the meter, and we try to inbuild all the furniture. So the furniture becomes really an extension of the architecture into the scale of the body. So it's the architecture sort of reaching out to that scale. And uh, but the, the difference has to do with, uh, you know, to use the meteorite as an example, the meteorite on the outside is a singularity, then on the inside, it's you know, a, a series of spaces that then you know, is extended to the scale of furniture. But then there are freestanding objects that, you know, lights and, and, and uh, freestanding chairs, etc., that work as, as an ecology of objects. And then you, when you, to do something like that restaurant that I showed in the beginning, I would think of, you know, these ecologies of objects and how they uh, work together and how they work in sequence and, and how they're embedded in the architecture, etc. And then, you know, one of the most, just for the sake of, if you have something to think about uh, for the rest of the evening, uh, I always think that the most sophisticated issue in terms of form to be in control of has to do with uh, representation. So, and, and that comes into play in different ways uh, depending on the scale of the, the, the objects. And, and uh, so you saw in, in the first projects how we use, we, we basically create things that belong to the ontology of sculpture that they're suspended in the ceiling, but then suddenly we would give the same kind of treatment to serve sort of things that belong to the, uh, to the build, seem to belong to the building itself. And, and we try to sort of challenge existing categories that the objects uh, belong to in this way. But, you know, use <clears throat> what we're trying to do, what, what I'm trying to do is, is using all of these devices trying to control not just the formal sensibilities and, and the affiliations, but also the kind of emerging narratives that come out of them. And this is the, what I mean by representation. So the moment you make something like the meteorite and you call it the meteorite, you're pushing the project, project towards a certain you know, world of imagination. And I always found that, I believe that in order to engage people, uh, it's very helpful to, if you can create this kind of effect. I, I always found it wonderful when Herbert Mouchamp wrote about the Bilbao by Frank Gehry that called it the Spanish Armada, the seven-year itch, or an artichoke, if I remember correctly, or the Maryland's dress in the seven-year itch, yeah. to create a building that, um, building or environment that has this very directed field associations, but the, none of these associations are settled. They're not obvious. So then you, then you can create this. I, I, when I was um, doing more academic work, I was interested in this idea of the figure that uh, Deleuze introduced and when he wrote about Bacon and the idea that you would create an architecture that's suspended between abstraction and representation. So it, it invites interpretation, but never settles into one. And the meteorite is really, for example, trying to do this, find that kind of place, and, and uh, uh, where it's it's very specific, but doesn't settle into one interpretation. And so to answer the question, okay, back to the question, I think these all of these issues are at play, but in different ways, and the different scales of objects are from the point of view experience, which ties them all together, you can use them quite uh, differently. And you can use them to address all the senses. And you can use them to address the human body at different scales, uh, from the scale of the crowd to the scale of the individual to the scale of the hand. That's great. That's quite a complete answer. Uh... We have another one here uh, from Alexis. It's in Spanish, so I will try to translate. Um, it, it's a, it's a, 
a question regarding uh, construction. Uh, he says that um, uh, the meteorite it's a uh, an irregular an irregular uh, polyhedron, and it's quite uh, difficult to be precise in this kind of shapes. He's asking how did you uh, avoid imprecision, or how, how did you get to such a precise um, object? And he adds that it's a uh, that, that the result is, is beautifully precise. I, I think he's Thank asking you. about the techniques uh, that you use in order to construct this so precisely. Yeah, you mean he means, does he mean like sculpturally precise or just that, it, you know, that tolerance, tolerances are? Yeah, similar. yeah, I believe that, uh, I believe that he's asking about how are the construction methods in order to get these uh, this precision, like these uh, uh, these angles yeah. getting to the right <laughs> place. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's the beautiful thing about digital design techniques. Of course, the computer is very, very precise when you work with it. And, and uh, when you digitally prefabricate every single piece, as was the case for this building, and the only you you have to be precise otherwise of course the project becomes impossible the project is essentially a three-dimensional uh, puzzle and the, the cross laminated timbers as i mentioned earlier is very good in the sense that it doesn't change its dimensions once like logs would sink over time like they would you would have to consider that in this case it doesn't really change its dimensions so you can you can cut it and you cut it with the machines and the machine is you know accurate to to a millimeter so the using a computer you know designing all the details in advance on the computer and then cutting it out of this particular material with a machine i mean automatically guarantees you that you have the pieces are precise the biggest challenge in building something like that lies with the assembly and how do you, uh, the foundation has to be perfect. If anything is off at the foundation, then everything is off at the top of the building. So, you know, if you don't have these kinds of prefabricated pieces, you have more flexibility there. And of course, in our case, the inside constellation of shapes was built first, and then it was wrapped in the outside, which has all of these prefab, pre-cut window openings, for example, that are connected by horizontal pieces. So, the, the assembly uh, work requires skill and expertise and, and uh, precision. Uh, so if, if the pieces which might be in themselves perfect are not to put together precisely, then you know, things start going off uh, significantly. On the other hand, the, the upside of something like this is that you almost immediately you notice if there's a problem because you start building it and you see that you know suddenly there's piece that doesn't fit and you'll know that something has gone wrong and you have to go back so you right. <laughs> it's kind of unforgiving but also instructing at the same same time but if you were to build anything like this all of the challenges have to do with logistics and, and the on-site assembly and they don't so if you know how to design a laser cutter model at school you're basically doing this kind of design and manufacturing work already. Right. But if you have to assemble that model, you you understand what I mean. Great. Um, well, I know it's late there, uh, so <laughs> I'm gonna. I have just one more question from uh, sure. Josefina. Uh, he says, "Hi, Kiwi. I understand that each type of scale entails its detail work." and that they have similarities and differences. But in which scale do you prefer to work on the most and why? Mm. I don't know, if I knew that, that I'd probably be, be working at that scale. <laughs> <laughs> I think I, I, I yeah. Uh, it's a it's a problem that I have. I'm sorry. <laughs> I I really enjoy 
moving between scales and, and I'm moving, you know, it's one of the wo most wonderful things about working in the world of design and architecture and, and refusing to kind of recognize difference or I'm not refusing to recognize difference, but I, I in a sense stand with Frank Gehry when he says that, you know, he doesn't think there's a difference between art and architecture. It doesn't mean that you don't understand that there are disciplinary differences, but that there's a certain attitude with which I approach all these scales. And I, I enjoy the the challenge of the new scale and, and of course of the challenge of the new project. But I, lately to, to give you some sort of answer lately, I have worked on these residential scale projects and I would say that I enjoy that at the moment the most because uh, in these projects, you, on one hand, you, you see intimately how people will use your building. You see how it becomes alive. It's not like it's beyond your control and you don't have to get any feedback. And, and you, you develop this intimate relationship with the clients, uh, not just in designing it, but once they they go in there, this other Uswa building, it's not finished yet, but we are there for the New Year's. And this moment when you, you're part of it and you see how everybody is behaving in the building and using it, I think that's really rewarding. And it, it teaches you a lot about, you know, which of your predictions were correct and which weren't. Hi. So residential scale projects, because of their because of their scale, uh, they give you this intimacy and they give you this intimate relationship to the, to the client and you give you this intimate understanding of how the architecture unfolds in life. I think that's really enjoyable because as the last thing, I'm, I'm like keenly aware that as an architect or designer, you don't control how people interpret or use your work that that's beyond your control uh, but you can it's a kind of uh, game and that, that's where the art really lies and you you have some intent and you want to create certain feelings and you have of course predictions but then at residential scale project you actually do get to see how your audience reacts and behaves over time and that's that's a really beautiful experience pretty nice okay well uh, I guess we are we are on time uh, to finish so I want to thank you again Kiwi thank you very much uh, for doing this uh, have a very nice time sorry for the technical inconvenience <laughs> in the beginning um, but I think sure. uh, it was a, a beautiful presentation uh, what you did um, oh, there you are so uh, I would love to to keep in touch and maybe do something uh, with, with this material that you present to publish it uh, here in the Institute we, we love to uh, work with fresh material and bring this material to places that maybe uh, take some time for for these ideas to to uh, to flow you know uh, so uh, it will be great if we keep in touch and, uh, and sure. do something I'd be happy this. To do so, so yeah. great so thank you very much Kiwi and uh, we well, hope thanks you everybody for a can. very nice questions actually I realized that the latter part was uh, more fun than the lecture the conversation I really enjoyed that very good <laughs> questions okay thank you very much Kiwi and see you soon see you bye bye nice from bye